what was the status of the company when when you joined and 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 what happened for that company to end up being acquired for over 15 billion dollars started having fun again and i started having ideas and i started dreaming about what was possible to create and the other principle that i heard from you is uh, caring less but caring deeply how does that work care less or i'm not going to swear but don't give an how did you acquire that skill? You know, it's <laughs> maybe it was part of my young days of hustling and trying to, you know, talk my way out of situations. And I, I'm curious to know, like, if you also got any type of professional coaching or how you also learn from other references beyond just putting yourself on the spot. And so I trial it out and I see what resonates. I see what people engage with. And that gives me the comfort that then when it's lifetime, I already know what I'm going to say, and I know what's going to work. This episode is brought to you by Pendo, the all-in-one product management platform for any type of application. With Pendo, you don't have to bounce around multiple tools to figure out what's really happening inside your product. Pendo makes it easy to answer critical questions about how users are engaging with your product, and then turn those insights into action. Also, you can get your users to do what you actually want them to do. Visit pendo.io slash product school to create your free account today and start building better experiences across every single corner of your product. That's pendo.io slash product school. Hey, hey, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Uh, get ready to be inspired by our next guest on the product podcast, Francois Agentstadt. He's the chief product officer at Amplitude. Amplitude is a leading company in digital analytics. Uh, it went public on the NASDAQ in September of 2021 and boasts an annual recurring revenue of $285 million. Uh, Francois's track record is truly impressive. Before joining Amplitude, he spent 13 years at Tableau, where he served as the chief product officer and played a pivotal role in its $15.7 billion, with a B, acquisition by Salesforce in 2019. Uh, pri prior to his tenure at, at Tableau, Francois spent a decade at Microsoft holding various product leadership roles. So, hope you enjoyed this insightful conversation around leadership principles and the future of data analytics. Welcome to the show, Francois. Thank you for having me, Carlos. So excited to be here. Excited to have you. Um, let's start from maybe the beginning. We'd love to learn more a little bit about how your upbringing you know, shaped the, the leader that you are today. Oh boy, you have to go all the way back to history. Um, so I was uh, born in Montreal. I grew up in Montreal and uh, I was a pretty regular kid, but uh, I've always had technology in my environment. My father was a professor of artificial intelligence back in the 80s before AI was the biggest thing. Uh, he was actually teaching uh, expert systems and artificial intelligence. And so we always had the coolest computers in the house to do his research. And so I got to play around with technology. Um, but I graduated very early and I left home uh, when I was 15. And I have been essentially figuring out how to live and how to survive and how to grow uh, since a very early age. And that has really been a formative foundation for me because even though I have been successful through my career, I still think of that first day that I was on my own having to survive and trying to get creative of how do you survive in this environment? How do you grow? How do you have impact? And how do you secure your future? And that's really been kind of core to who I am. I love that. Um, uh, so one of the things that I noticed in your track record is uh, Tableau huge company and you were there for 13 years. So I'd love to learn more about you know, what, what was the status of the company when, when you joined and, and, and what happened for that company to end up being acquired for over $15 billion? I mean, the Tableau story was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, prior to Tableau, I was working at Microsoft. I was in the office team, I was in the SQL Server team, but I always wanted to go back and roll up my sleeves and, and just do something. And living in Seattle, I saw this company that was really just young uh, called Tableau. And back then, it was more Tab Who. Nobody knew who Tableau was. They were a tiny little company. 
And I remember uh, looking at their product thinking, oh, they're just a visualization tool. N they're never going to survive. We have that in Excel. We have all the charts in Excel. We have the best tools in the world. Uh, but I thought they must be doing something right. So I checked out the product and I had my list of requirements. And uh, after a few moments, I was like, okay, they do this, they do that, they do that. And within a couple of minute, moments, I just put my list aside and I started having fun again. And I started having ideas and I started dreaming about what was possible to create. And that's how I started at Tableau. So I joined the company in 2010. I was the first product manager hired. Before that, product management were the founders. They were responsible for the strategy. And uh, I did everything from you know, thinking about product strategy to feature requests to everything that was required to get done to build this company. When I joined, uh, we were about 100 people. Revenue was about $12 million. And we scaled it to several billion dollars of revenue, which is amazing. And through that journey, we became a public company in 2013. Uh, we ended up bringing in new management in 2016 with Adam Salipsky, who was uh, the CEO of AWS. Uh, and eventually we got acquired by Salesforce uh, in 2019 for what was then the fourth largest enterprise software acquisition in history. Uh, and I stayed at Salesforce for four and a half years. But in each phase of the journey, I was always focused on learning, on growth, on having impact. And it felt like at each moment, there was always an opportunity to learn something new and be challenged. Uh, and at the same time, continue to develop my skills, but also impact customers. Uh, and that's been the constant throughout each phase of the journey. And each phase is unique, but each phase provides so much experience and so much knowledge that it just kept me motivated and we had incredible impact. What I what I find extremely complicated is is to be able to to thrive in all of those phases. I've seen a lot of people thrive in this zero to one stage of being this, this scrappy, you know, founder, scrappy product leader, but learn how to grow as fast as your company and continue serving as a leader when you are a public company or, or also part of a, a company like Salesforce. Like how did you kind of have the awareness to say, okay, something is changing and I like make those changes before you are forced to, to make those. You know, I think there, there's some people who linger for the past. They look at, oh, what it was. Oh, remember when we were only 10 people? It was so much easier. I'm always looking at the future. I'm always trying to think of where are we going next? What do we have to build next? What's the next challenge? And so I was recommend that for people to not just look backwards, but think about what's ahead. And so if you know that what you're trying to do is say, climb Everest, climb a mountain, you know that you're going to have to make it to base camp. And there's a set of challenges that are going to be needed when you make it to base camp. After that, are you done? No, you then go to camp one and there's another set of challenges. And so if you're motivated by challenges, by growth, my view is lean in, go and learn. What can you experience? Uh, because you become a stronger leader at each phase of that journey. And by the way, when re re you reach the top of Everest, guess what? You find another mountain, another big hill to go climb so that you can expand your growth, your experiences, uh, and your learning journey. I think that's a good point because I interact with a lot of product leaders uh, and others, other more like entry-level product managers tend to default to do more of what they are good at. While in reality, in the example that you are sharing, it's more about going into the area that you're not the best at yet, but by pushing yourself to try that new thing before it becomes obvious and, and you're probably too late. Absolutely. You know, I think as product managers or as leaders in general, you always have, want to have a learning mindset. You always want to be learning the next thing. And if you want to solve problems, every situation is a new problem to solve. 
And it could be organizational problems, could be customer problems, could be scale problems, or it could be figuring out how to start something new in a large company. You know, really ask yourself, what are you trying to solve for? What problems are you motivated by? And lean in on those uh, and constantly push yourself to want to do more. Don't settle. Don't try to just, again, look back. Push yourself to the next limits. So if I were to zoom into your schedule, what are some of those main themes in, and, and how do you allocate time for, for everything? Uh, you know, I, there's lots of different ways of answering that question. I think first, just on time management, I think of myself in terms of, I spend about a third, a third, a third of my time. A third of my time is with the engineering team building products. A third of my time is with customers, learning about the problems, engaging them. And then a third of my time is spent across the company, you know, aligning teams, marketing, sales, etc. And I put I started there because at each phase of the journey, where you spend your time may be different, but the kinds of problems that you have to face will be uh, will be unique. So for instance, in the early days, you're gonna spend a lot of time maybe one-to-one -one with customers. In the later days, you might be spending your time thinking more of how do I create scalable mechanisms so that what I do can reach a thousand customers or 10,000 customers. But at each phase, I always think about the set of questions that you have to ask. What's the impact on customers? What's the impact on partners? What's the impact on uh, performance, on scale? What, how will this solve new problems in new ways for customers? And I just constantly rotate around these, but I always think about the customer at the heart of everything that I do, no matter whether I'm a, working on a new product or a large product. You know, and I, I spend a lot of time in this topic and, and I, I always share calendars with, with other executives just to learn more about how to protect time and on the things that really matter and push the, the company forward. Because it's clear that you can always get as busy as you want, just putting out fires. So and I, I think of the inbox and Slack, Microsoft Teams as a defense mechanism. Nobody's job is to answer all the emails. So protecting your calendar and auditing it regularly I think it's a good way to, to stay in check because next time you know you have way too many interviews, way too many of something, and then, oh my God, we forgot to work on the next big priority. It's true, and I'm, I'll say I'm probably the worst person to talk to about calendar because I love to live in the world of being overwhelmed. My calendar is packed. Every moment of my time I consider valuable, and so I fill it. I also live in a world of being overwhelmed by emails, Slack messages, RSS feeds, because I, I want to suck in as much of the information as possible. Um, and not everybody can live like that, but that's how I prefer it, because then that keeps me always uh, very, very active, uh, and that keeps me going. When I slow down, I really crash. So I try to keep at that high pace. What's important, though, is to be really focused in the moment. So while you might be multitasking right, from one meeting to different, when you're in the moment, this is what you do. This is my time. And so my time management is really about focus time uh, at every moment of the day. But it's overwhelming, and my calendar is, is a disaster. <laughs> Maybe we can compare calendars of the record. Um, <laughs> um, I want to keep talking more about some of your leader, leadership principles. Um, I heard that uh, you're not the biggest fan of frameworks. At the same time, I'm not. You, you run a big team and structure is important. So I'm curious to know how you balance that structure with the creativity. Look, um, it's not that I don't like frameworks. I think frameworks are very useful tools to help you think through problems. I think that frameworks help you tackle different situations and they give you a grounding to think about how to solve a problem in that situation. The reason I say I hate frameworks 
is the over-reliance on frameworks. Sometimes I find that people fall in love with the framework rather than falling in love with the outcome. They celebrate making it through the ritual, not celebrating the success that comes out of it. Um, and so that's really the thing I, I, I despise or I try to push on is really fall in love with the outcomes you're trying to drive. Fall in love with the customer problems. The frameworks help you get there along the way, but they're a means to an end. And at every phase of the company, the frameworks that you use, the, the mechanisms that are in place will, must evolve, will evolve, and must change. So my advice to everybody is use these as tools to help you think. Don't use them as a replacement for the job that you have to do. And the other principle that I heard from you is uh, caring less, but caring deeply. How does that work? I feel like I have very uh, controversial terms, but yes, one of my core things that I tell people is care less, or I'm not going to swear, but don't give an F about it. What, what I really mean by that is I find that People are their worst enemy. Uh, you self-censor self, you self -censor yourself because you're afraid of how you might be perceived, how you might show up in a meeting if you say something stupid. And my point is, stop caring about yourself. I, and I say that like lovingly. But care about the outcomes. Care about what you're trying to drive. And this was all rooted at the very beginning of my career. I worked at Microsoft. I was very young, early 20s. And one of the first tasks that I had to do was I was asked to present to the most senior people in the company. These were basically Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer's direct reports. And they wanted me to present on the state of the business intelligence industry at the time. Now, here I am, a 20, I think I was 23 years old, a 23-year-old kid talking to these very successful, very senior, very impressive leaders in the company uh, on the industry. What the hell did I know? And uh, I remember uh, I was in the meeting doing a prep, and one of the people in the room, I didn't know who, who he was, uh, made some comment, and I just said, well, that's, that's stupid. That's not true. Here are the facts. That person was a senior vice president. He was the leader of Excel. Uh, he was very successful, very accomplished. Uh, but I believed that what I said was right. And it didn't matter that they had that title. I was after the facts. I was after the outcomes. And, and I actually found that situation very liberating because now it enabled me to show up the way I want to show up and enabled me to focus on the principles or the outcomes that I thought were really, really important. And when I do that and I don't think about, oh, I'm not gonna speak up because I'm gonna say something, something stupid, I speak up, I sp say my opinion, I, say, I share my thoughts candidly and openly with anybody that wants to ask it. Um, and that's really, really important. And when I started at Tableau, I remember my first six months, I was so frustrated. I didn't know what was expected of me. I didn't know what was success. This was a, a startup. I had worked at big companies. Um, I was afraid. And it clicked in my head, wait, why am I self-censoring myself? Why do I care what the founders, uh, why are they asking me to do? I'm just gonna go focus on what's important to drive this business forward. So I cared less about me and I cared deeply about the outcomes. And guess what, all of a sudden, I got a Founders Award for the most impact. I started growing in my career. I started being pulled into more situations. It was liberating and it was empowering and then they gave me the freedom to drive so much more growth. So care less, but care deeply about the outcomes you want. 
I hope some of your team members are listening to this so they can start pushing back even, even harder when they hear this. But I agree. They I, mean, I, I, they I asked my team to do the same. And I know it's counterintuitive because why should I push back on this executive, this leader? But it's what I need, right? Like I, that shows me that someone is caring enough to speak up uh, versus like what I would think about them. Uh, so thank you for, for, for sharing this vulnerability. Exactly. It's just not obvious. It's not. And, you know, have you heard the principle of disagree and commit? Oh, yeah. Uh, from Jeff Bezos. Of course. It's a great like Amazon leadership principle, but it, it's connected in a way to this idea of caring less. Because what disagree and commit means is not that just that you disagree with the decision. Disagree and commit is an opportunity to share your point of view. Make sure that you've been heard when a decision is going to be made. And you could be on the other side of the decision, but at least you've shared it and you've been part of the process. And then when you, dis when, then when you commit, you will go all in on the outcome. Even if you're on the other side, you will do whatever it takes to make that decision the most successful decision, even if you disagreed. And so you have to really shed your own personal ego, your own personal pride, because you know, you thought something different and you have to really lean in on whatever decision is to make that successful. And that's a hard skill to learn, but it's a critical skill to learn because it enables you to drive more success and more impact, I believe, in the organization. And I think this is related to another leadership principle that, that you mentioned, act as if, right? Usually the people who push back the most come from a place of care are also the ones who end up being promoted because in a way they've been leading before the, getting the official recognition. Yes. So act as if uh, is this statement I've been using for a long time where whenever somebody says, how do I get promoted? Or they complain about some leader making some decision. I tell them, act as if. If you had that role, what would you do differently? What questions would you ask? What would you have to trade off in order to make that decision? So don't think of yourself here. Think yourself at the next level or at the next opportunity and act as if you had that job. Because once you start acting as if, guess what? All of a sudden you become that leader because you're thinking more broadly. You're thinking more holistically. You're thinking about all the possible variations instead of just your own little world. And you know what happens when you start acting as if new doors open and eventually you're already doing the job and you get promoted for doing that job. That's the way to do it. Don't wait for the role. Act as if you have the role now and it'll lead to success tomorrow. Francois, you studied computer science, right? I did. I was not very good. Uh yeah, me, me, I studied the same and I wasn't good either. And uh, I see you are an incredible public speaker, not just in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I've seen some of your videos. Uh, how did you acquire that skill? You know, it's <laughs> maybe it was part of my young days of hustling and trying to, you know, talk my way out of situations. Um, but I was fortunate that early in my career, I had to you know, share ideas. Uh, I worked at this little startup after school um, where I was in the office of the president, not the president of the United States, but the president of that company. And so I had to pitch ideas for what we should do all the time. And that was kind of the beginning. But uh, in my career at Microsoft, I got to do demos. Uh, demos for Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, Jeff Frakes, all of the leaders at Microsoft, where I got to deliver on stage in front of thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and this, that was really formative for me to, to do some public speaking. But I will say for every product manager, demos is the number one thing you have to learn. Deliver a demo, deliver your value prop, deliver you know, what the solution is to your problem. Learn to demo because the demoing skills is what enabled me to be in front of senior executives, and what enabled me to get comfortable talking publicly 
to thousands and thousands of people in, in massive stadiums. It's incredible. But here's a little trick I learned along the way. Many times when people present, they think about the content they want to deliver. The trick is not to deliver what you want to deliver. You want to deliver what your audience cares about. And so when you switch your mindset from talking about you to talking about them, all of a sudden you're sucking them in. You're connecting with them in new ways. And so at every slide, at every moment, you think, what's in it for you? It's the wifi, the wifi. Uh, and I had a, a presentation coach that helped me do that. Uh, and so now every time I present, it's not about the slide, it's why should you care? What's the wifi of the slide? And I focus on that, what's in it for you? Uh, and when you do that, like you're connecting, you're connecting with that person. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I wasn't. Uh, I was sure you weren't going to say. I learned how to speak in public in my computer in science classes because at least I wasn't supposed to speak and speak in public, and that's something that didn't come natural. But I agree. These days, in a way, like it's, it's one of the most important things in, in in your job. And I, I'm curious to know, like, if you also got any type of professional coaching or how you also learn from other references beyond just putting yourself on the spot. I mean, I've had lots of coaches. Uh, I've had coaches who uh, were preparing CEOs for IPO tours. I've had coaches who were more theater directors because sometimes when you're presenting on a public stage, it's like doing a public presentation. You are a, you're doing a performance. So you have to perform and act uh, for the stage and for the audience to engage them. Um, and so I've had some really, really incredible, incredible um, coaches. And um, I'm happy afterwards to give you references to some of them because uh, they're so good. But also, um, I always seek feedback. So when I present, I ask people in the audience to give me feedback. And by the way, I coach a lot of people on public speaking. Uh, and I'm very harsh. I'm very direct. And I'm a pain in the butt, uh, but it improves the bar all along the way. One thing, though, that I encourage other people to do that I don't do, I hate it, is you do have to rehearse. Um, I hate rehearsing. It's the worst thing in the world uh, because I present without any notes. And so I kind of like make up the story along the way. Uh, and I, I think about my script along the way. But the way that I've actually started preparing my speeches is I do it with customers. So especially when we're in a B2B world, in a technology world, instead of just thinking about that big moment on stage, I start delivering the pitch weeks in advance by doing more one-to-one -one or one-to-few presentations. And so I trial it out and I see what resonates. I see what people engage with. And that gives me the comfort that then when it's lifetime, I already know what I'm going to say, and I know what's going to work. And you even um, work with a coach to, to improve or to, to overcome your accent, right? Yes, I did. I don't share this very often, but I did. Um, you may not hear it from my voice, even though I have a little bit of a tickle in my throat, uh, is I'm French. Donc je suis français. Uh, my... First, like I went to school in French. I was born in a French family. But uh, when I was in school and I graduate, I used to speak uh, like this. Uh, and, uh, you know, the accent is very nice. But the problem is that when I was very young, uh, people would look at me and they see that I am young. And then they would hear my voice and they would say, I don't understand. He must not be very smart. Uh, he probably is not the person I want to work with. And that I found was very limiting. And so what I did was I, um, I hired a coach, a voice coach, just like the actors, uh, you know, Margot Robbie, she's from Australia, but uh, she's able to sound like an American. Uh, a lot of British actors sound American. Uh, I did the same thing. 
And then I started to learn how to speak like my audience. And I started to speak like an American. And so the same way that actors can change their accents for different movies, I was able to do the same thing. And now I do it all the same. And now you know what the problem is? When I go to different countries, I go to Spain or Italy, uh, I can't speak American English anymore. I speak the, like, the broken Spanish English or the broken Italian English because I'm kind of mimicking and learning from the environment I'm around. I love that. And, and thank you again for, for sharing that little story with, with us. Uh, as someone from Spain who also has an accent, that's uh, something that I find fascinating. And it was also a, a barrier in my career, especially early on. Um, I just overcame that with confidence. <laughs> I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to speak with my hands. I'm just going to get my point across and somehow you, you get it. Hey, guess what? You cared less. You cared less about your impediment. You focused yeah. on the outcomes you're trying to drive. See? Works every time. <laughs> well, let's talk about org design. That's another topic that I love. And for someone who is at the top, who's leading such a large product team, and I see that you, are, you oversee not only product, but design and growth. So can you give us a sneak peek into how the, the current org at Amplitude works for you? Well, I mean, first, broadly speaking, every org design is, has some pros and some cons. There's no perfect design. It's all a matter of what problems you're trying to solve. And then you structure yourself based on optimizing for the problems you solve. And at different phases of the companies, you, you might reorganize based on the situation and how you're trying to solve you know, for a new set of challenges. Um, and it's really, really important because whether you're in a startup or in a mega company, there isn't one structure that works best. It's really about adapting to the situation you're in. For us at Amplitude, we're really structured around the phases of the business that you're in. So we have the analytics team, which is really kind of the large scale business where they have thousands of customers they have to think about. They have a lot more enterprise challenges. Then I have what I call the, the um, uh, emerging team, where that team, for instance, our experiment team uh, is in that group where it's a smaller scale business and they're still innovating, but they have to move faster maybe than the core analytics business. And then I have a incubation team. They're doing the zero to one. So if you think about like incubation, it's zero to one. The emerging team is like 10 to 100 and scale is 100 plus. Um, that's really how the teams are structured. And then I have the design team that's aligned to those, essentially each pod one to one. And then I have an operations team that supports it all. So for, for us at Amplitude, it's really around managing the size of the business and putting people that are great for that stage. At Tableau, we had a different structure. We were structured more around technology pillars, analytics, data, experiences, and then we had a platform team that supported all. That made sense because we shipped one big product that all came together. And so you had specialization. With us, we have much more different blades that are interconnected through APIs, but can run fairly standalone. And what about the growth team? Aha, I forgot that one on my list. <laughs> but the growth team is another, I'll call it, it's, it's almost a platform team where they are focused on a very core set of outcomes and they experiment very, very quickly, but they're shipping the whole. So they are a dedicated team reporting under me uh, and they are very much focused on driving signups, activation, monetization, self-service, et cetera. And they run very, very, very tightly. Uh, and we have a growth engineering team and a growth marketing team, and they're very much connected at the hip. They do report into different organizations, but they act as one big pod together. Because yes, I've seen growth in general it's not building core features, right? They're mostly about in, uh, focusing on incrementing the usage of certain use cases, so free to pay, pay to more pay, things like that. Correct, but they are still building 
experiences, they're, they're breaking down barriers in the product. They might not be building you know, the core charting features or the core analytics features, but they're enabling everything along that funnel to drive customer success and eventually monetization and retention along the way. Yep, and, and I think that's, I that's great. Actually, that, sorry, I was going to say that the product teams are now more accountable for revenue growth. It's something that I didn't see back in the day in a lot of product functions, and now it's becoming more of the norm. Correct. And for us, all the teams have their own North Star metrics, but they're all tied to business outcomes. Um, and so every, every one of the teams, we have our own you know, set of metrics that we look at all together. But the growth team thinks a lot about signups, activation, logos, right? And they just optimize, 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 optimize. But they're partnering with every team to ensure that they're plugged in in the right way. So they're not, they're not siloing, but rather they're enhancing. And I think that's, that's a really, really important function of growth. Yeah, and, and what, is the, so what is the title of the highest ranked person on the growth team? Is this a VP of growth? VP of growth. Got it. That's cool. Well, let's talk about your latest and greatest launch. I see that you announced recently a Snowflake native amplitude. Um, what is that? So Snowflake Native Amplitude is essentially uh, the ability to run the full Amplitude platform directly on top of Snowflake without requiring any data movement. So it's live SQL queries pushed down to the, SQL, uh, to the Snowflake database uh, so that you have one single source of truth, one set of security and governance. So all the power of Snowflake with all the power of Amplitude. That's what it is. And if you go step backwards and you say, well, why is that important? Because in most product analytics tools, in order to use them, you have to move all your events into that platform. So you have to ingest and, uh, and ingest all of that, those events into their platform. So there's data movement. Uh, it creates drift in the data if the data ever changes. There's cost associated with that data movement. Um, and it requires just more effort for customers to work uh, with their data. And data is you know, the fuel of most organizations. And so it's a very, very important asset for organizations. And so what we did, which is a very, very, very hard engineering project, is we said, what if we could remove the engine of Amplitude, right, our core proprietary in-memory engine, and replace it with a common database that's out there, like Snowflake. I mean, this is not a small effort. This is a massive engineering effort. It also required a lot of conviction that this was the right thing to do. Uh, it's almost like a car company, right, that has a gas-powered car deciding to go electric. You don't just replace the engine and you move it over and you say, great, I put a battery in instead. You have to rethink how the car works. You have to rethink so many different aspects of that car. There's still a steering wheel, still, still takes you from A to B, but the core aspect of how that thing operates had to be completely reimagined in a new world. But we made yeah. that bet, we made that investment, and the feedback so far has been so enthusiastic. <laughs> I think that is part of what I consider the future of product. Like if product teams need to be strategic, they need to understand more about how the business is working completely. And the product analytics, I mean, Amplitude, I've been following Amplitude for a long time. We had two co-founders on the podcast a long time ago. They, they started as a product analytics company, right? So you could get a lot of behavioral data about how your users are using a product. But then all this data around finance or CRM was in different systems. So bringing all of those systems together so a PM or someone else can ask a question and gather the insight regardless of where that data is stored is something that I haven't seen before. And I always request as a CEO, you know, I really don't care where the data is. I ask a question about how much money we sold or what happened with that customer. <laughs> and I need to see the res response. Absolutely. And, you know, you could use that, you could integrate that data today. You would just have to move it from your CRM or your finance system into Amplitude, which means now you're 
duplicating the data. And if the data changes here, you have to keep it up to date here. So it just creates a lot of work on Teams. But I think to me, the biggest learning is not just that we were able to deliver this capability. The biggest learning is that whoever is listening to this, you're in a team and you have to take risks. And you know, you may have read the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, but when there's shifts that are happening in the market, how do you respond to those shifts? Do you ignore them? And do you say, ah, it'll never be as good as what we've built? Or do you lean in and learn and be curious and have a beginner's mind of what's possible? And we've seen this shift happen over the years. Think about you know, when we went from on-premises to the cloud. There were so many companies, database companies that said, ah, we have the fastest thing on-prem, the cloud will never be as fast. Where are they now? They don't exist. Snowflake showed that you could be a fast, high-performance database in the cloud. And those companies are irrelevant. At every moment, you have to ask yourself, am I staying stuck in the past or am I moving to the future? Notice how it's a consistent theme? Lean in, lean to the future. That is really, really fundamental for everything that we do. As I, as I think about the future, and business, even business, business intelligence space, so obviously Tableau got acquired by Salesforce, but also um, other company, what was the other company that got acquired by, by Google? Looker. Looker, Looker got Looker. acquired by Google. Yeah, and then Microsoft has their own BI solution. Amazon has their own BI solution. So as, as you see the evolution of Amplitude going from just product analytics into much more than that, and you see these other companies doing BI, so what, how do you see this, this, this whole space shaping up? Well, first I'll say is we're not business intelligence. Amplitude is not doing BI. What Amplitude is doing is we're providing an opinionated layer on top of the data purpose-built for the use cases that we're solving, which are around product analytics. Think of doing funnels, retention analysis, cohorting. Those are core fundamentals in our platform that don't exist in more of the horizontal BI platforms. So I don't think of them as competing. They're really complementary for different use cases. A traditional BI tool thinks in primitives of rows and columns, while a product analytics tool thinks in primitives of users and events. They're very different levels of the abstraction. They're a higher level, but we differentiate based on the value we add for the use cases we solve. That's our core. And understanding that core is important. The data becomes a shared element. We're just enriching that data with our own opinionated point of view. And so again, like if you look at whatever tool you're building, you have to understand deeply your value proposition, your differentiation, your purpose in life, and really, you know, how you are adding value and solving a problem 10 to 100 times better than anything else that's out there. And that's really what I think about. And ultimately, every builder that's out there, whether you're in product or marketing, in engineering, or you're a developer, like everybody's going to be building products. We need to be able to help everybody build better products faster. That's my reason of being. And that's what I'm adding every single day in our product stack and thinking, what will enable somebody to build better products? What's getting in their way? What do they need? And that's what I'm solving. But I'm using data as my light. I'm using data as the guide to help bring those experiences forward. And you, you mentioned that your dad was an artificial intelligence uh, teacher before AI was cool. Now it's cool. So I want to learn more about how you're thinking uh, AI or Gen AI can accelerate your, your future, vision for the future. I mean, we're in this really exciting time in the industry where everything's about to change with AI. And yes, we're at peak hype of AI, to be clear. There's a lot of ideas. Not all of them will turn into reality, uh, but there's so much potential and it's clear the future will have AI at the center. But when it, people say AI, it means a lot of different things. Of course, there's predictive analytics, but there's also generative AI, which is really where the current AI trend is all about. 
For us, it's really three key components. One is simplification. There's a lot of things that used to be hard and manual that we can just simplify with AI. So we've already embedded in the product uh, some ways to that we're, where we're using generative AI to auto-create titles, auto-create calculations, auto-create charts. Like we're taking the complex and making that simple and the AI is perfectly suited for that. Number two is, so if number one's simplification. Number two is all about augmentation. How do we enrich your experience with AI? So that when you look at some data, for instance, uh, we could have a co-pilot alongside you that tells you what you should be looking at, what matters and you know, where you should look at. So imagine if you had the best product manager in the world sitting with you at all times. What would you do, right? You would ask better questions. You would figure out what the next steps are better. Well, that's the augmentation piece that we're really, really thinking about, where we can bring the power of data uh, together and enrich it. So think of the, the co-pilot ideas uh, along there. The third theme is really on automation. What can we do automatically? And for us, we're thinking really in the, along the lines of self-improving products. How can the product continuously be learning and adapting to the users or the situations that are out there? AI is perfectly suited for that. And so really there's a lot of different areas where we're putting AI both as a core ingredient to make our product easier to use, we're creating new experiences with AI, and then we're completely reimagining the art of the possible with AI and pushing the boundaries of where the future product's gonna go. Francois, I love this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your time with all of us. I know you like to pack your calendar, so I'm grateful that you slot in an hour with me. Well, thank you, Carlos. And thank you for all that you do at the product school. You're doing some really, really important work and uh, enabling the future leaders uh, with great skills and bringing the community together. Uh, really thankful for everything that you do every day for uh, Amplitude and for this community.